Okay. Socratic peg. All right. So yeah. So what are we doing? We're doing this uh, paper by Peter Bogosian, Socratic pedagogy, perplexity, humiliation, shame, and a broken egg, but in educational philosophy and theory from 2011. Socrates has gone out of his way to engender a state of perplexity. Shame and not logic is the critical tool or weapon in Socrates' elenctic refutations of his interlocutors. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. No one cares about contradicting themselves because contradicting yourself doesn't hurt. Other things hurt. So it's like you need more than the contradiction. The whole point of like uh, when you argue and you're doing contradictions is that you lose the argument. But so what? If you have like the bigger stick, it doesn't matter if you contradicted yourself. So it's like, yeah, contradictions on their own don't do a whole lot. They need to be in context. They need to like, you know, have like something behind them. You have to fuck up and then do it. Oh, no, it doesn't. What? I mean, unless you feel bad yourself, but that's where we're getting the shame here. This is where I think we're going to do. Like, uh, we're talking about shame. Like, do you feel bad about it? But unless it's, uh, like, if I contradict myself right now, you guys might be angry at me, but, like, it's not going to, like, really hurt myself. Yeah, and you contain multitudes. Exactly. And there's, uh, what's a nice line from Jay-Z. Like, I know I contradict myself. I know it. I don't, don't tell me. I, I know that. It's like, he knows. Or was that a biggie? Uh, see, Shane's not here because Shane's broadcasting. Shane would know where that line's from. Um, but it's like, he's like, I know I contradict. I don't need to hear that now. It doesn't matter. He's still the boss. Like, I know I contradict myself. But that's the other thing. What was that? Bridge of Lies says the boss is wrong quite often, but he's always the boss. Like, sometimes it doesn't matter. So there's other things besides just contradicting yourself. I've argued this before. Logic is not like the end all be all because you can do stupid things in logic if you want to but a lot of times you're just wasting someone's time or your time if you're like saying stupid shit and that's really the problem it's not the contradiction it's the triviality the triviality is the problem you've just wasted everyone's time and there goes my voice <coughs> and so that's the thing okay do Socratic educators attempt to humiliate, shame, or perplex participants? Daniel Pekarsky, among others, has argued in Socratic teaching a critical assessment that the intent of the Socratic method is to cause participants to become perplexed, confused, and confused, and that Socratic teachers think that is desirable. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm at that arcade age where my voice is changing. Yeah, I'm getting older and everything's breaking on me. Um, Pekarsky and others articulate a common misunderstanding of Socratic p pedagogy that has unfortunately worked its way into the educational and philosophical literature. Specifically, the misunderstanding centers on the idea that the purpose of the Socratic method is to cause participants to become humiliated, ashamed, or perplexed, often so that some greater understanding can result. This article attempts to correct this, these misunderstandings. By using concrete examples, I argue that the purpose of the Socratic method is not to humiliate, shame, or perplex students but to help them have beliefs that accord with reality. To make this argument, first I must explain what the Socratic method is, second I explore humiliation and shame as they relate to Socratic pedagogy, and finally I examine the idea of perplexity and what it means to be perplexed. Correcting this misunderstanding matters not only because it clarifies a pedagogical and exegetical confusion, but for eminently practical reasons. This pervasive misconception of the purpose of the Socratic method has the very real potential to deter educators who wish to draw upon Socratic pedagogical elements. Do people really think that this is the uh, something that happens? I mean, I know we just referenced everyone up here, but how many people are like, oh yeah, Socrates, that great teacher? I don't think there's that many people that be like, oh yeah, the Socratic method. Maybe like they'd still do this in law school and I'm basing my understanding of law school on uh, Legally Blonde here. I don't know, but like who really does Socratic uh, education? And there was just an article about like like uh, professors who were kind of bastards and put people on the spot. And like, is that really, were they, did they think they're being Socratic at that point? I don't actually know if this is a thing. Maybe, but I don't know. All right, so author says this is problematic because Socratic techniques have emancipating potential. Do they now? Um, they can help participants formulate arguments, improve their critical thinking and moral reasoning skills, learn to dis distinguish truth from falsity, and even reduce prison inmates' recidivism rates. 
Oh, okay. So learn philosophy. You won't go back to jail. What is the Socratic method? The Socratic method is intrinsically as well as extrinsically valuable. Life is worth living only so long as one is examining it. I mean, okay, so it's good. That doesn't tell us what it is. It's just saying is good. I like it. Uh, Unreal says, I think some of these conservative classic colleges like the University of Austin Bar Weiss thing at least claim Socratic method. Yeah, I mean, that may be the case, but do any of them actually try to be Socratic or are they just paying lip service? I always get the sense that people are claiming the history because they think it's impressive. Do they actually know what they're talking about? Who knows? Are they just being assholes when they put people on the spot? Maybe. I don't know. But like this said nothing here. They just say, hey, we like the Socratic method. The Socratic method refers to a type of pedagogy employed by Socrates in the Platonic dialogues. Socrates never explicitly states that he has a method nor a way to explore questions and ideas. Rather, scholars have inferred the method from various dialogues. Socrates' pedagogical method or way of engaging ideas through discourse consists of five stages. One, wonder. Two, hypothesis. Three, elenchus. That's a refutation and cross-examination. Four, acceptance, rejection of the hypothesis. And five, action. I will, need, I will now briefly explain each stage. Um, <laughs> this wonder already has me, uh, like, I'm like, what? <laughs> wonder. Um, you're guessing, and Bogosi has joined the University of Austin, too. You know, that's fine, too. There are more than one way to, like, you know, run schools and, like, teach people. And if people are thinking this is useful and they're making hay out of it, cool. Like, if it works, great. So it's like, I'm, like, I might be poking a little bit of fun out of here, but, like, I, it could be great. Like, could be fine. I don't need to, like, uh, like, could, like, this all could just work out. So, no big deal, like, either way. But then again, no claims have been made, so we'll see. The first stage of wonder begins with a question. Questions usually take the form, what is X? Specifically, questions from the Platonic dialogues include what is justice? What is temperance? What is courage? What is worth dying for? What is piety? What is friendship? This stage of the Socratic method consists only of posing a question. Okay, see, like that. That's fine. It's not really wonder. It's just pose a question. That is a normal way to start a, uh, you know, a discussion. Let's talk about this. What is it? In the second stage, hypothesis, a possible or tentative answer to the question is offered. For example, if the question posed is, what is courage? A possible response could be, courage is doing what, what one thinks is right, even if that is difficult. In this stage, an answer to the question is presented. There is no evaluation of that answer. <clears throat> Again, fine. It's like, let's go find an example. That's all that says. What is courage? Here's an example. Fine. The third stage, elenchus or refutation, rests at the core of Socratic pr uh, practice. In this stage, a counterexample to the hypothesis is offered. The purpose of the counterexample is to call the hypothesis into question, that is, to show that the hypothesis is false and thus undermine the interlocutor's claim to knowledge. Specifically, if the counterexample or the example given shows that the hypothesis cannot be true, then the participant cannot be said to know what it is that he is claiming to know. Continuing with our example above, if the response to what is courage is doing what one thinks is right, even if it is difficult, a possible counterexample would be, well, what if one does something one knows is right, but it takes no effort to do so? For example, what if I know it's right to give my daughter a present for her birthday, and that's not difficult at all? Is that courageous? Do I display courage by doing so? This is a counterexample because it prevents a viable challenge uh, a yeah, viable challenge to the hypothesis showing they cannot be true. It shows by offering a concrete example that courage cannot be what the interlocutor thought that it was because one can do something that one thinks is right, and this is not always courageous. Finally, for the Alenkis to achieve its epistemological ambitions, it must not merely point out contradictions in one's belief system, but also persuade one to change one's mind. Okay, so this is a massive claim here. How the fuck do you actually persuade someone to change their mind? That is ridiculous. Um, because it rarely ever fucking happens that anyone changes their mind through an argument unless they already had like a lot of background knowledge and they already considered the other one to be viable no one just be like oh i'm wrong i'm going the other way that's not how people are so i'm already like calling foul here like this is in a dialogue in a fictional story people can change your mind in real life this doesn't really happen and tindarios i think you know this people get angry with you if you start undermining their shit they don't start 
being like, oh yeah, you're right. I need to re revise everything I was thinking about because you undermine my argument. It's not what happens. So like in a platonic dialogue, which is a fictional story, no one was claiming any of this stuff actually happened. Yeah, you can persuade someone to change their mind, but that's not what is realistic. Secondly, Alenkis also means more than uh, is being described here. A lot of times the way Socrates went through asking questions was it didn't have like Socrates didn't bring anything to the table. Socrates used what the person they were talking to, the stuff they said against them. So it was actually a very sophisticated uh, argumentative strategy because it says, well, you're claiming this, you claim that from this and that this follows, but that's bad. And so Socrates didn't make any claims that the other person didn't wasn't already committed to. So Olenkis is actually very sophisticated in the Platonic Dialogues because Socrates was uh, using people's own words against them. So not only was it like, okay, just, you know, giving a counterexample, it was a counterexample born from their own words. That's very different because then it really gets at the heart of what uh, the person was saying because it couldn't possibly make sense. It's not just a counterexample. It's a counterexample born from what they said. Um, so there is more to this uh, Alenkis than I think is being given credit here. <clears throat> okay. In the fourth stage, accept, reject the hypothesis. The participant can do just that, accept the counterexample or not. If the counterexample is accepted, then the participants go back to stage two and offer another hypothesis. If the counterexample is rejected, then both parties agree that it is neither necessary nor sufficient to undermine the hypothesis. In this example, did the counterexample of courage do as doing what one thinks is right, call into question the, the knowledge claim presented in the hypothesis? If it does not, then the counterexample is rejected if the hypothesis is tentatively accepted or considered to be provisionally true. Uh, Amiel says, I like when Socrates said to the kid, you know math, you just don't know you know math. It's like reverse gaslighting. See, that's the trick. That was the genius of Socrates, that he was using their own reasoning against them. It's not just that you give a counterexample. It's you give a counterexample that they should have already known about. And so, um, from which book is that? That's a really classic one. Um, geez, I, I don't know. We need like Aris here to give you the quote. But like actually if we like Google that, like um, that's like super classic. We might even just be able to find that. Who creates math boy? Let's see. Mino. See, slave boy experiment in Plato's Mino. Like it's like super, super famous. So. me no so <clears throat> all right what were we doing oh wait, we're here so okay thank you valpo yeah uh, <laughs> it's like asking me history or philosophy questions i'm like i gotta look that up i don't know these things um uh, all right, where were we? If it does not, the counterexample is rejected, then the hypothesis is tentatively accepted or considered to be provisionally true. If it does, or there are other counterexamples that show the hypothesis is flawed, then the discussion returns to step three, Alenkis. After the process of examining counterexamples has been exhausted, then one enters the final stage of the Socratic method and acts accordingly. That is, ideally one would act on the findings of one's inquiry. Yeah, again, this is all very idealized. The idea that people just do this in real life is, it happens in the Socratic dialogues, but that's a fictional story. Yeah, Socrates is final boss. Like, the idea that you're going to go up against someone that is going to take your own words and twist everything you said um, against you, like, that's basically uh, final boss philosophy. So, okay. This is also, just in general terms... This is very scientific methody uh, that Bogosian is putting forth uh, here. So even if he is 100% correct about like this sort of general scheme he's putting out, it's very in the modern contemporary like zeitgeist. It's this very uh, modern sort of like scientific method. And that's not wrong, but it should be worrisome. They weren't doing the Socratic, the scientific method back then, and also we're not really, we, 
in the philosophy of science, we're actually moving away from the Socratic method. So, like, this actually feels to me kind of like it's a 2011 paper. It feels of a time and place, actually, which it shouldn't do. And at the time, I bet it didn't. But I like right now with a little bit of distance and not much in terms of philosophy, it still feels like um, a time and place paper where you're kind of superimposing a scientific method look at this. And that's not necessarily wrong, but it does kind of give me this weird sort of like, oh, yeah, you were writing in this sort of like mentality where everyone was still like 100 percent on the scientific method because philosophy of science has kind of moved on from just like the idealized scientific method. Um, wish Agni were here. He could give some background on that. Which, speaking of, while people are here, remember all of our friends. If you are interested in philosophy stuff, click on said links in below. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, Ivan's here in chat, of course, rated. Thank you again, Ivan. Um, he's right there. We've got the, uh, Ask a Philosopher peoples. Like, if you want to go see them once a month or so when they stream, they should be streaming next Friday because they do the first Friday of every month, usually. You can't make a tomlet without a few cracked <laughs> Greg's Jesus. Retheus, what's up? Um of course our buddy Aristotle, everyone should go follow him. Also, of course, Ann Fernald's here. Shane McGinnis, if you are not like got Shane up in another tab, shame on you. And uh Kali Oxen for you, of course. I'm on the technical side of things, philosophy of language. If you are I know we a lot of people hail from like the uh ethics side they're interested in that but if you're interested in like technical linguistic philosophy she does a linguistic stream but she's gonna be on vacation for most of august too so but like she's good people and uh lumpy of course is a chemist hi lumpy and uh you can talk science and stuff with him but he also likes talking finance and uh like personal like growth stuff like go get your shit together thank you lumpy yeah lumpy's like get your shit together kids i'm like yes you are right lumpy and <laughs> we should get our shit together <laughs> <sighs> except uh yeah that was a wonderful story you told about how you and muffin got together speaking of getting your shit together <laughs> thank your sister okay humiliation shame and a broken egg the most common complaint against the socratic method is that it is cruel and psychologically abusive socratic professors are quick to criticize and perfect student answers, subjecting students to public degradation, humiliation, ridicule, and dehumanization. This torture often scars students for life. Yes. <laughs> so much shit so little together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Again, this is the thing. This is really weird. Like, you wouldn't think that this was get like, this sort of paper would give me a time and place feeling, but yeah, this is like legally blonde level shit right here like the beginning of legally blonde where uh, reese is there and she gets humiliated in class it's like yeah this was like kind of like what was in the mentality back in like the 90s i don't know if this is actually a thing i just kind of like watched the movies and <laughs> there was to be fair there was just a recent article on a uh, daily news saying that like people remember their hard ass professors now the question is is that a good thing or a bad thing? Do you just remember them for being very significant because they were assholes or because they were actually helpful? And the problem is people remember the assholes because they were assholes, but that might be um, skewing people's viewpoints. Legally Blonde is not an example of Socratic method in your opinion. You're probably right. I don't know exactly what these people mean by Socratic method. I mean, I was talking about like the sort of maybe a little bit more technical philosophy viewpoint of it, but like this exactly sort of this public degradation, humiliation, ridicule, and dehumanization, maybe that's it. But again, from what Bogosian said above, that this seems wrong already. But of course, that's Bogosian's point that like, where's the dehumanization here? Um, Socratic method is a tool for showing that a person's naive preconceptions are flawed. Yes, but it seems like there has now been added on it's a limit. It, no, no, 100% right, Ivan. Um, it just seems like it nowadays it comes with a, a bad attitude on top of it. So, yeah. Uh, Unreal Brian says, is it a method because Socrates loved it or does Socrates love it because it is the method? Yes. Uh, and the more sophisticated answer is not even close. The, this is what Plato's reconstruction of Socrates' method is. So, we don't actually know if this is why it happened. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, was the original Socrates a good attitude? No, he got killed. 
He got himself murdered because uh, for pissing off the Athenian government. His attitude was not pleasant. He kind of was a dick about it. Um, so, yeah, and that's a historical fact. Like, we have records to say about that. So, yeah. Well, he killed himself. Well, he was. they were going to kill him anyway. But, like, again, that was kind of the thing. Bye, Ann. Bye, bye, bye. Go give Ann a shout-out, too. Shout out the Ann. Ann. Yeah, so everyone go follow Ann. Also, sociologist or ex-sociologist now. Doing some still work in the area. And uh, good friend and good people. And can you can go talk and chat with Ann about basically anything. She knows her stuff. Uh, yeah, that's a thing on Real Brian. So it's like, again, the idea that we're bottling anything on Socrates is not always the best idea people uphold him like the greatest philosopher or whatever of like whatever for whatever reason but is this really he may have been smarter but the, maybe his methods need to be modified like this is not necessarily a good idea to be copying someone who pissed off the uh everyone else like his students loved him but then again like assholes get a following too yeah exactly with this total dickle but he was evocative but you know cult of personality you don't have to be nice to have a cult of personality like you don't like people love donald trump is donald trump the epitome of argumentation i don't think anyone makes the uh claiming that he is maybe he has like you know people do like how he argues i'm not saying it's like bad how he argues because it, clearly it's effective but like they're not saying he's like super sophisticated they're just saying it's effective what he does but it's like you can get yourself a cult of personality without being a grand philosopher you can just you know do your thing which donald trump does and you, he does what he does well enough and it works for him so it's like that's the sort of thing um was socrates cruel to his interlocutors i would say not yeah again this seems to be something added on later. I agree, Ivan. Like, but like, I think this is Bogosian's point: is that what we've done to the Socratic method is uh, maybe not fair to Socrates. He says, "All right, Ivan, how do you think the argument between Kant and Socrates goes?" Ha ha! Just imagine anything would be a disaster. It would be, but I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, Kant seems like he would be deferential at least because he was sort of formal guy. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It'd be interesting. Like, I don't remember how people spoke of Kant personally. You think Kant would win. I mean, are we talking about Kant given all the historical stuff that he knew after? Or, like, on a sort of an equal footing? Because it's really unfair to, like, it's 2,000 years. 2,000 years between the two. And so it's like, if we're talking, like, raw argumentative power, or are we talking, like, in general? I don't know. Rethia says Kant is pretty set in his logical arguments. I think Socrates would turn one too many rocks and piss him off. That's the thing. I don't know how, uh, I don't know what Kant's uh, disposition was. I don't remember. Or maybe I knew at some point. And so would someone like Socrates, a gadfly, annoy Kant enough to piss him off and like kind of get him, uh, un, like, uh, it was like rather uh, feathers ruffled. Ivan Neo says Kant was very careful, but as you like to point out, most of what he wrote just wasn't interesting. Yeah. So, uh, Kant was swole with raw argumentative power. Yeah, he was a thick boy. <laughs> yeah, so, like, I don't know. This is uh, one of the, we need, like, to bring back, like, those uh, cage matches, like, greatest philosophers of all time. Kant versus Socrates. Fight! Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember uh, it was the, uh, what was it? the battle of the weenie uh sports people and it was like tiger woods versus like roger federer or something or like pete sampras it was so long ago and uh, it was really funny so like pete sampras or like roger was running around with a tennis racket and uh like and tiger had his uh golf clubs that was a fun show okay anywho so yeah maybe we are misrepresenting we've like sort of we're just assholes is basically what it is. And we're claiming the Socratic method to cover up for our assholery. And uh, that's not fair. And Bogosian looks like he has a point here because I think he actually has a point here. <laughs> there has been a spate of literature written on shame by philosophers. Well, that's fair, but that has nothing to do with the Socratic method. Psychologists and educational theorists. 
there is a convergence of opinion regarding the role and consequences of shame as an educational or moral tool. Shame appears to many thinkers to be altogether too blunt an instrument for motivating people to have morally good character. Shame appears to be far too painful an instrument for its moral benefits, if, in fact, there are any. Um, Ivanov says, I think Bogosian is going to say it's not about shame. Yeah, it looks like that. And the question is, are these people just talking about shame in general, or are they talking about the Socratic method? I just don't know. Okay. Putting aside the more conspicuous issues regarding using shame as a method to facilitate student learning, are the inculcation of shame and humiliation really what happens either as a result of Socratic inquiry or during any of the stages of Socratic method? Do learners become ashamed and humiliated as a result of undergoing a Socratic dialectic? Simply, no. Often, as a consequence of sustained Socratic dialogue, one realizes that one did not know something that one thought one knew. Using the example of courage above, upon entering the dialogue, one could have thought that courage meant one thing, but by the fourth stage of the method, when one's claims are subject to closer and more rigorous examination, one may realize that courage did not mean what one thought it meant. That This realization is a pivotal step in helping one's make one's ideas clear and in distinguishing truth from falsity, and yet it is hard to understand why one would believe that this discovery could be humiliating or shameful. For one who is simply curious about the world, correcting one's beliefs and coming closer to the truth is not humiliating or shameful, but exciting and wondrous. And this is unfair. If you're t Remember who Socrates was talking to? He was talking to people, not kids who knew math. He was talking to like people who were like responsible people, important people in the Greek society. And so pointing out that they don't know what they're talking about isn't nice. And that's why he got killed, because he was pissing people off. In When you're talking to, like, you're poking holes in people's, like, jobs and their, like, livelihoods, that makes people nervous and scared, and they don't like that. And so the idea that we're walking into this la-di-da, we're going to learn something, yeah, that's nice, but, like, that's not what happened. Um... Socrates was annoying. Uh, was the annoying guy who was actually right, but is also making you the fool. That's see, that's the thing. You can't like in history. It's one thing to talk about the dialogue when Socrates is talking to a boy and showing that he knows math. It's another thing when you go up to like a general and be like, "You don't know what you're talking about, military stuff." It's like, shut up, Socrates. This is the general. Like, come on. Yeah, and power of people are not going to like that. And so again, we're talking. What there's a little bit of a disconnect here. The platonic so uh, dialogues with Socrates, these are not like recounting of like, I don't think anyone thinks these are like verbatim things that actually happened. Yeah. So, well, disrespected Ale did he disrespect Alexander the Great? Like that's more Diogenes I told him to get, um, <laughs> get out of my light. I don't know if he did. I don't remember what, if there were any, uh, Socrates, Alexander the Great, uh, interactions. I mean, maybe. Well, Diogenes told him to have his son, but that's not Socrates. Yeah, yeah. So, and again, that didn't piss off Alexander. Alexander was impressed that Diogenes didn't give a fuck. Um, so, like, that was a completely different situation. And remember, Diogenes thought Plato was a jackass. So, yeah. So you, you got that too. And these are the platonic dialogues written about Socrates. So... Well, Rethius, one a day we will aspire to have balls that big. That's all. <coughs> all right. When people are shown certain mathematical or physically counterintuitive demonstrations, for instance, they are not humiliated or ashamed, but excited and delightfully surprised. Yeah. Yes, uh, Peter Bogosian. When you talk about, like, math and they like math, that's cool. That's not what happens when you're talking to generals um, <laughs> and you're talking about courage. For example, in my critical thinking classes, I asked students what would happen if I dropped an egg out of a third or fourth story window onto a lawn. After a curious look, they respond that the egg will break. When I actually drop an egg out of the window, however, the egg will, n will normally not break as long as I get it hits grass and not a bare spot or a stone. As many times as I've done this, this counterintuitive egg phenomenon is still astonishing to behold. Um, Buckminster Fuller designed geodistic domes, for example, the astrodome based on the strength of the eggshell due to the way it distributes forces. See, this is interesting, but again, remember, we're kind of disconnected from our food in uh, modern society, too. Unreal Brian says, Aristotle tutored Alex the Great, so he might have been too young to run into Socrates. Good historical point. I completely forgot about that. 
So, yeah. When students learn that their intuitions in such matters are mistaken, in this case, that the egg will not break, they do not feel humiliated or ashamed. Rather, virtually everyone thinks it's cool. Yeah, again, you're talking to students and you're doing something that has no consequence in their life. None. Like, you're not talking to, like, people who are embarrassed by showing that they're stupid. When you're doing, like, cool stuff in class, it's like, hey, you're the fun teacher. It's like, yeah, dude, wrong, ex but, like, that's not the point. That's not what happens. Granted, you're still right, Peter Bogosian. You shouldn't be pissing kids off in class because they do think it's cool when you're not a dick about it. So that's fair. Vithya says, what best in that story with Alex the Great is just kind of humoring his old teacher with this weird old guy in a wine jug in the square and being the Times Square loud oddity. Yeah, I guess you could, it could be taken that way. He was probably stoked by being around home and drinking, being with family. Alex was in a good mood. Exactly. It didn't piss him off. There was nothing at stake there. It was just kind of like, I think the story, the backstory was that Alex had heard that there's this like kind of great philosopher and there were philosophers around in uh, Greece at the time. And he was like, you know, you could go talk to this kind of cool guy. He's like the philosopher Diogenes. And so he's like, you know, hey, I'll go. I'm Alex the fucking man, the great. And I'm going to go talk to Diogenes, see what he has to say. And Diogenes just doesn't give a shit. And like, so, you know, like great recognizes great. He was like, the man is talking to the, like the most powerful person in the entire world and doesn't give a fuck. So it's like, it's, of course he it was humoring him slightly, but like he could have been like, you deserve to like give me some respect, but Alex clearly didn't care. So it's like, you know, it's cool. So yeah, Ivan says the undercurrent is that some people think ideas are violence. So Socratic dialogue is uh, scarring college kids and Bogosian in your opinion is correct that they are wrong. Yeah, I'm getting that. Like if, if, people think that like this sort of mean Socratic way is uh, the way to go. I think um, Bogosian got a point. I just don't know how big of a slice of people actually ever thought that. Maybe there were more of them out there than I realized. And there are lots of assholes out there. So it's entirely possible that this is a significant portion of like old school instructors. They thought this was the way to do things. So yeah, I, I mean, w like if I'm giving uh, Bogosian a hard time here, like, he may just have a point. Like, he might be right. Like, I don't really love the history and stuff, but, like, so what? It's like, he might be right, regardless of uh, any of the little problems along the way. All right. Realizing that one does not know some particular facts has nothing to do with humiliation, shame, or perplexity. It simply has to do with knowledge. For example, if you are about to jumpstart a car with another car and battery cables, I want to make sure you know that you do not attach a negative to the negative, but that you attach a negative of the live car to the ground frame of the dead car. So I might say, you know, you're not supposed to hook the negative to the negative right in order to get your attention and make sure you are focused on a potential hazard. That is not a Socratic question, but it has the same kind of point that many Socratic questions in stage three of the method have, and that some lecture points have uh, as well to help people see that they have some mistake or incomplete be uh, beliefs so that they can try to make sure that their beliefs accord to reality. Acqu asking these types of questions is not about causing humiliation, shame, or perplexity, but about helping people realize mistakes or errors in reasoning so that they can correct them. That's fair. You can make sure who you're talking to knows what they're talking about, but you do realize that that can piss people off. You're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. You think you know better than me? Then you do it. Like that sort of thing does happen. So it's like, yeah, you might just be checking to make sure the person knows what they're doing. But like, again, there is danger there. Similarly, that one would not seek truth when one mistakenly thinks one has it is not because one is smug or because one suffers from more, a moral deficiency, but because one has no reason to find out something one believes one already knows. That's fair. Like, if you think you know something, you don't have to go asking about it. To use the example from above, when I ask students in my critical thinking class what happens when an egg was thrown onto the lawn from my third story window, they immediately answer that it will break. My response to them is, that is not true. You just think you are smart, don't you? Now, Lumpy says, as a New Yorker, I am well versed in the intricacies of being pissed off. I am well versed in like, this is really funny. It's like, it's from the, uh, what is it? Uh, the, that Australian guy movie. Uh, Crocodile Dundee, you have to learn how not to piss people off. You have to understand what it is to be pissed off and how not to piss people off. There are too many people here and you have to know how not how to deal with people in New York. It's true. Like it, Crocodile Dundee is like, oh, there's millions of people there. It must be the friendliest place on earth. No, but like a lot of times, yes, like people have to be nice. 
And so I was like, you have to understand the difference between being nice and being pissed off. So you are right, Lumpy. Um, yeah. So people uh, do not think that they are particularly smart. They just think that is the they just think it's the right answer they do not consider knowing that eggs break when thrown out of a third story window as something that requires great intelligence there's no reason for them to think otherwise unless someone points out their mistaken belief or just drops the egg and shows them that it does not break if one witnesses the dropping of an egg out of a third story window the point is to demonstrate that it does not break not to make students feel humiliated or ashamed for not knowing it would not break the point is not to humiliate people, though seeing the eggs not breaking is confusing, but to facilitate thinking about how this counterintuitive phenomenon works, which most people wouldn't have no reason to think about, not because of smugness or arrogance. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, Rethius. Like, there's a lot of misconceptions across the country. It's a big country, and people get nervous. Like, you don't have to go that far. My dad used to work not very far in New Jersey, and people from not very far away would never go into New York because they were told it was scary and they are going to get mugged. Shane, what are you doing? Shane, welcome in. Shane McGinnis, let's give you yeah, adventure. How was the uh, Tolkien? How are how is the end of the Tolkien stuff? I lurked for like a minute or two, then I had to start uh streaming myself. Shane. Uh hope it all like ended up real well. Um yeah, welcome Raiders, welcome Raiders. So welcome in. Hey Brittany McGinnis, how you doing? Uh Paradox Moose, welcome in. Uh Shane, welcome, yep, yeah, welcome, welcome. Who else we got here? Yeah, welcome in. Uh anyone who does not know me, I'm Nogur, no gray, no Greyo. Whatever you want to call me, I don't care, just don't be mean about it. Grethar, well, welcome in. Yeah, I'm. I do philosophy. We read philosophy. We're currently discussing. Do you have to be a dickhead to use the Socratic method? And the answer here is no. We don't think so. But a lot of people, you know, want to be confrontational in their talking. And the authors here is like, no, that's a completely silly thing to do. Uh, Shane says it was pretty. You don't have to. You can curse now, Shane. You're not streaming anymore. It was pretty darn good. I'm happy that I got to get it out into the world. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad it ended up well. Yeah, because I was out all day and I couldn't. I just got back a few minutes before stream, so I was like, I can't watch Shane. But yeah, it's not your normal stream night. So yeah, flip and shoot, Shane. Yeah. So excellent. I'm happy you got it done. Believe me. Like when I heard that, like you weren't gonna go present it, I was like, those motherfuckers. They, they, like you put all this time and effort in, and then they're pulling the rug out from underneath you, bastards. Um, like literal like goblins. Um, so yeah, the, the vods are coming. Yeah, got to figure out how to make use of that stuff. Uh, Shane, would you be a hobbit or a gondor or a golem? I, I would not know how to answer that. It's for Shane. Um, yeah, so if you don't know me, I read philosophy, we discuss it here, and uh, thank you again, Shane, for the raid. I hope all of you had a wonderful time I, for the parts I was there. I saw some of the previous episodes, it was excellent, so yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah, anyone here should go follow Shane. He's a historian and sociologist and teaches uh, way too many classes. <laughs> yeah, so... That's the thing. You hobbit all the way. All the, when you watch Lord of the Rings, you skip all the hobbity parts. Wow, you lost the good life. Yikes. Yeah, you know. Let's see. I don't know. I just asked Shane who has the best life. Is it Tom Bombadil? Maybe. Shane says I'd probably be someone from the southern part of Gondolin, where the people only had a bit of the good uh, Numenorean blood left and had gone to seed. <laughs> uh, yeah fantasy stuff ale pipeweed ale and pipeweed for me thanks yeah that's my plan for a uh, vacation and next week yeah bombadil totally his best life yeah it's like i don't know gondor not gondolin okay sorry i don't know i don't know these things yeah see tom bombadil is just logan Roy cruising around not dying in middle earth it's the thing there's always gonna be someone who has it good in the world i don't know yeah yeah, it's like, why can't I just win the lottery? Chill out, not have to do anything. So, who knows? But anyway, like I said, welcome in everyone. We can try, unfortunately, I don't know enough about Order of the Rings. The most I know is really the uh, movies. I have not read the books, so I can't really speak on any of this stuff. I don't, I don't know things. I know nothing. See there, the, my, my Socrates is coming out. You just got to know that you know jack shit, and then you know something. 
Anyway. So, yeah. Okay, so let's just get through a little bit more of this. All we're discussing here is what is actually a useful method for getting people to realize they don't know something? Do you have to, is there, are you inherently a dick for showing people they don't know anything? And the author here, Bogosian, is arguing, no, you can really try to inspire wonder, which is the better uh, reaction to uh, things, than to undermine people in a way that makes them feel uncomfortable or humiliated or ashamed. <laughs> no, I don't... <laughs> I didn't think so, Shane, but uh, I was apologizing to the rest of the crowd that, like, if you ask me questions, I just can't answer. Like, you can, <laughs> I'll tell you I can't answer this shit. Uh, being a dick is, see, that's the thing, Ivan. Being a dick is irrelevant, you will be assimilated. I think a lot of these people have that uh, attitude where the way they go about this doesn't actually matter, that it is irrelevant. And so you can be a dick or not be a dick, and they're like, well, being a dick is actually helpful in some small way. And see, that's a problem. That is, like, I think that's actually going to sort of the phenomena here is that being a dick cuts down on, like, all the extraneous bullshit. And so being a dick while doing the Socratic method is actually helpful in some way. We will add your biological and technological distinctiveness to our own. Yeah, see, that's a funny sentence. How do you actually add distinctiveness to something else and maintain the distinctiveness? Like, how do you get uploaded into uh, cyberspace and maintain your uniqueness? Who knows? Okay. A Socratic teacher going through each stage of the Socratic method may help students see that they have inconsistent beliefs and or that they have assumed what, tr what was true was really not. Uh, there are a fair number of actual psychopaths in academia. Yes. Rithi says... You use nanorobots that force them to be your cyborg race. Duh. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, we're overdoing the Star Trek at this point. Yeah. Oh, I like the Today's Lucky 10,000 VXKCD. Yeah. Hey, what's up, Uncle Bill? Yeah. I mean, relevant XKCD. Uh... Yeah, so the process may be confusing and it's possible that some students might infer incorrectly that the teacher thinks that they are stupid. It's true. Like, when you're teaching kids, you don't think they are stupid. You think sometimes they don't know stuff, but you don't think they're stupid. That's unfair. But from the other side, you don't always know that. You think, oh, they think I don't know anything. They must think I'm stupid. However, embarrassment or even shame is a result of psychological factors that the student brings with her into the discourse and unrelated to the pe to pedagogy, Socr Socratic or otherwise. This does not negate the fact that there may be some educators who use the Socratic method for the sole purpose of humiliating students. Yeah, but this is the, this is a little unfair. Of course, some of them are psychotic, but that's normal. Uh, you know, society has crazy people. <clears throat> They perhaps mistakenly believe that shame is somehow good for learners or because they think that intentionally creating confusion in learners gives the learner a sense of accomplishment. But this is an issue of teachers who abuse their power and who happen to choose the Socratic method as a vehicle to discharge their abuse. Okay, is it? Is there nothing to being a dick when teaching? They're saying no. There is nothing to being a dick when teaching. I don't know. Like... Maybe there's a reason that people are dicks when teaching. Maybe not. But, like, just claiming it doesn't really, uh... Like, and they're referencing themselves here. I don't know if that's the case. Might be, but maybe not. Like, maybe there, there is something to being a bit more uh, rough around the edges when teaching. I just don't know. Something intrinsic to the educator's psychological makeup and their power relationship with students acts as the conditions for the possibility of abuse. That's fair. As we've seen, shame is not the right tool for motivating people or the right tool for discharging one's educational objectives. Probably not. I don't know if they made that argument. There are other ways to do things. I think as much as they've demonstrated here is that shame and humiliation are definitely not essential parts of the Socratic method, and so there's no reason to do them. You'd need some further reason to employ them. I don't know what those reasons would be, but uh, like just a priori, I don't know if, uh, like, I can't make a claim that they aren't actually useful. Roots of misunderstandings. The Mino, the slave boy, the stingray, and Socrates' intentions. Okay, quote, The account offered by Socratic teaching highlights the teacher's effort to guide the student from complacently held but not 
yet adequately examined opinion to a state of perplexity. Pekarsky and uh, end quote. Uh, Pekarsky and others use Plato's off-sided example of the numbing effect of the stingray to explain what it feels like to be per perplexed, assuming I can speak anymore. Socrates, even before I met you, they told me that in plain truth, you are a perplexed man yourself and reduce others to perplexity. At this moment, I feel you are exercising magic and witchcraft upon me and positively laying me under your spell until I am just a mass of helplessness. If I may be flippant, I think that not only in outward appearances, but in other respects as well as as well, you are exactly like the flat stingray that one meets in the sea. Whenever anyone comes in contact with it, it numbs him, and that is the sort of thing that you seem to be doing to me now. My mind and lips are literally numb. I have nothing to reply to you. Yet I have spoken about virtue hundreds of times, held forth often on the subject in front of large audiences, and very well too, or so I thought. Now I can't even say what it is. End quote. Once one undergoes a Socratic dialect, dialectic, the result is that one often does become perplexed, numb, or even helpless, as if one has been stung by a stingray. This claim is often true. What is untrue, however, is Socrates' active role in bringing about this state of perplexity. Did Socrates really desire to demo demolish intellectual smugness and induce perplexity? What, what, uh, uh, I can't speak, I'm losing it. Was this really the objective of the Socratic method? Pekarsky repeated questions the wisdom of leading the student from unexamined opinion to perplexity as if this is the intent and purpose of Socratic method. He believes that educators employing Socratic ped pedagogy think that inducing perplexity is justified because the critical role they are believed to play in the pursuit of truth, which itself seems to be valued primarily as a means of improving the human condition. Pekarsky claims that Socrates believed that perplexity and intellectual humility have value not in themselves, but that perplexity has a pure instrumental value, because it may give rise to knowledge, and knowledge is good because it will improve our lives. Um, okay. While there is scant textual evidence offered for this assertion, those who argue against the Socratic method almost universally refer to the above famous passage from the Mino to support their position. Perhaps this rests at the heart of the misunderstanding. The way Pekarsky and others use the Mino generally, and the passage quoted above specifically, is a misappropriation of the context of the dialogue. Socrates is trying to show that knowledge is recollection, that is, that knowledge is a rem remembrance from a previous life, and that even uneducated people like a slave boy have knowledge that they do not realize. Socrates demonstrates that even the slave boy can figure out a complex mathematical principle simply by being asked the right questions. During during points in the dialogue, the slave boy incorrectly intuits some particular propositions. So Socrates wants to, him to identify his own errors, both so that he can more readily see the correct answer and so that he can achieve a deeper understanding of the issue. But Socrates' point is, uh, is not to cause perplexity for its own sake, but to do a number of things, one of which is to arouse curiosity about what is true. Yeah, I mean... What is the point of, of what Socrates is doing? It wasn't to piss people off, but that is what he did in real life. But like, again, that's not what was happening in Plato's dialogues. Again, fictional accounts. So, this passage characterizes the way in which those whom Socrates questioned saw what he was doing. But it is a charge that is leveled against Socrates and not a description of how Socrates intended the method to be used or understood. Yeah, but, you know, like, you can be like, oh, I didn't mean to piss you off. That wasn't my intention. It's like, yeah, but you definitely pissed someone off. And even if it wasn't your intention, you may have done so anyway. And you should have known better. Like, so just because it wasn't your intention, that doesn't always, uh, that's not always a defense. Just because you didn't mean to hurt someone, it's like all you can say, like my grandma always said, if you do this and like you like break something, all you can say is sorry. It's like you didn't mean to. That doesn't matter if you broke something and you can't put it back together. It's a Humpty Dumpty situation. You can't put it back together again and all you can say is you're sorry. That's not good enough every time. Especially for smart people who should know better. Continuing. 
Socrates' interlocutors may have seen it this way because they were resistant to thinking or to follow a line of reasoning no matter where it led, and they thus saw Socrates as trying to use verbal and logical trickery to confuse them. Ironically, they thought that Socrates was a sophist, but this quotation cannot stand as a description of the method as Socrates saw it any more than, char than the charge of corrupting the youth of Athens is how Socrates viewed what he was doing. Yeah, but see, that's exactly the problem. You are still pissing people off, even though you don't think about it. Exactly, Unreal Brian. I'm sorry you chose to be offended. It's like... <laughs> Yeah, and you were doing stuff that you could have known would piss people off. So this is, again, there's a disconnect here between the Socratic dialogues and the historical Socrates. The historical Socrates was smart enough to know that he was pissing people off and he was arrogant about it. The Platonic Socrates was doing these things and it all magically worked out in the end in Socrates' favor. Again, history and fiction don't always align as opposed to what J.R.R. Tolkien thought. <laughs> I'm sorry I just butchered your stuff, Shane. <laughs> oh yeah, and Shane, if you need a rest, go feel free to don't stick around. Go uh, revel in your successful streams. <laughs> Coming out of the cave, perplexity and engaging difficult ideas. Quote, it is not a blanket destruction of all his beliefs that Socrates wants, but a dialectic, meaningful discussion of the most serious matters. Any teacher who would seek only to destroy a pupil's beliefs is missing the point. End quote. And that's from Fulkerson. There are two types of perplexity. One type of perplexity results in trying to figure out a lecture, explanation, description, phenomenon, etc. that is confusing or unclear. The other type of perplexity occurs as a consequence of engaging difficult novel or unusual ideas or phenomena in which one crosses the boundary between intuition and reasoning. I'll now address both types of perplexity as they relate to the, uh, the Socratic method. Okay, so what is this? So something is confusing and then the other one is novel. Fine. So we've got uh, something is inherently confusing versus new. It may not be confusing, it just might be new to you. All right, the main problem with claiming that Socratic pedagogy instills perplexity is that it confuses an occasional result of the method with its purpose. The fact that some people may become perplexed or uncomfortable, confused, uncomfortably confused during a Socratic discourse, particularly if it is a difficult subject, challenging concept, complex line of reasoning, or heterodox idea is examined, does not mean that it is the pedagogy that caused the learners to become perplexed. That's kind of begging the question there, Bogosian. Maybe it was the line of per questioning. It may also be the content, but you just don't know all the time. Using our egg example, it is not the tossing of the egg out the window that caused students to become confused. It is the eggs not breaking. Fair. In this example, that's right. If you throw an egg out the window and it lands in grass, chances are it won't break. That's kind of cool. It is not the process of the method, but the consequences of the truths discovered. Yeah, except Socrates was asking really leading questions, and people might not be so happy with that. Fair, though. I mean, most of the time asking questions, are like, hey, I'm just asking questions. It's one of the things that gets me. Just asking questions. Just, just stating stuff. Again, not always innocent. Not always innocent. Might be, but not always. I'm just, just saying, bro. You can, when people say that, this is like saying, I'm not racist, but you, this is one of those things. You know they're saying something racist when they're saying just, just commenting or just saying, no, you weren't. You were making a, a point, and then you're trying to pull it back by saying, oh, I'm just making a comment. No, 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 no. You brought up that example for a very specific reason. And it's like, that's not innocent. It's not innocent. Okay, the Britney Spears, not so innocent. It is certainly the case that in Socratic discourse, participants can become confused and perplexed, particularly in stages two and three of the Socratic method, but that is usually because a deeper examination of one's beliefs is inherently challenging and difficult, like, for example, introduction to calculus. Garlikov related the following uh, about one of his ex-students who wrote him and asked for help with a calculus problem. She wrote, uh, define the limit of f of x from x going to a, 
uh, means for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Yes, this is in a high school AP calculus class. Why? Our teacher says that if it is the basic of all calc, and I am so lost my head is spinning. This example is not part of the Socratic method and has nothing to do with it. It is about calculus. Does this mean that calculus is only meant to perplex students and to make them feel humiliated? Of course not. Yeah, so if like you don't get the calculus, that's okay. But it's that the point of calculus is not to piss you off. I mean, it just isn't. People like math for other reasons, not because it makes other people angry. Okay. In this example, the meaning of the word limit in calculus was confusing to the student, especially since the definition her book provided meant absolutely nothing to her. Well, again, limits are weird, but that's all right. It is not the case that the author of the book used a definition intended to make her head spin. Rather, it was a combination of her examination of a difficult concept and an unclear explanation that made her head spin. The Socratic method does not cause either type of perplexity, examining and engaging difficult concepts, or trying to figure out something that is conveyed in an unclear way does. These are crucial distinctions. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's again, content versus delivery. If the delivery is okay, then you're getting confused on the content. But of course, you can screw up both. But uh, Bogosian's right here. Like, content and uh, delivery are not the same. In any pedagogical context, if one were neither confused nor perplexed when initially examining a difficult concept or subject, then it's questionable that one's subject matter was as difficult as one's one thought, as one thought or one's examination as probing. In this sense, being confused and perplexed is a natural consequence of dealing with difficult concepts and unrelated pe pedagogy. Frank says, I'm not racist, but Socrates didn't know calculus. Yeah, I mean, didn't get invented till a little bit later, so he didn't know it. Although Socrates would say he did know it in a previous life because all knowledge was in like, well, Plato. Plato Socrates would say it was part of the uh, world of forms and he could know it. Uh, when from when he had descended from the world of forms into the actual world, he had forgotten all of this stuff, and he would know it. Anu O'Brien says Delta Epsilon is for math profs who are too weak for infinitesimals. There you said it. Yeah, I mean, you go out there with the hot takes on the uh, math uh, peoples and the Delta El Epsilon calculus or whatever it is. <sighs> actually, I've heard from uh, one of my professors, actually, once said that there were... Uh, virtues to a delta epsilon math that had been lost when we had just completely ignored them and you want to bring some of the delta epsilon back. Frank says, doesn't knowing even mean anything before you've descended from the world of forms? Exactly, Frank. Exactly. So this is just completely unfair to Socrates. Completely. Yeah. Alright, so again, if you are delivering stuff in a way you're like method of teaching is not particularly confusing, assuming it isn't, then it is all the content that is really getting people people perplexed. Again, there this is more sophisticated than it sounds. The choice of what you are presenting people sometimes is front-loaded to fuck with their heads. Like, you can't just jump in to, like, calculus without the basics of, like, t first teaching them how to add. If you just go from calculus without teaching people how to add first, then you've got problems, and it's not just, um... It's like you've somehow missed a step there. So it's not always, like, there is something about your presentation, like, you need to present things in a, a certain sort of order, the right sort of way. So it's not as cut and dry as being made here. The examples used do matter, and that is a question of also delivery. What order they do present the material in. So it's not always so clear that you can separate out uh, form and content. But for the most part, yeah, as long as you're, uh, the delivery method, sort of like the form of presentation, is not that bad, yes. You, it, the things that are being talked about, the content, might be the more confusing of the stuff. Of course, alright, continuing. I keep harping on this, but like it's a subtle point, but it does matter. Of course, there are bad educators, for example, teachers who do not listen well, who cannot articulate clearly, who become frustrated and impatient easily, who move too quickly through a topic. Yeah. See, again... Bogosi knows this, but it's uh, trying to discount it, but it's not so clear or it's not so easy all the time. All right. So who, the educators who choose to use employee, 
uh, choose to employ Socratic pedagogy. However, there are good and bad teachers who use a range of pedagogies, and using the Socratic method does not mystically and, and formulaically make one a good teacher, just as using a lecture-based delivery mechanism does not make one a good or bad teacher. If one is a poor educator, then, it, then any pedagogy, content delivery method, or approach to a teaching may not work well, and would thus be more likely to cause confusion and perplexity than teaching methods used by a good teacher. Yeah, I mean, there's more than one way to teach, of course. To confuse or perplex students is not the goal of inquiry, but a possible result uh, or byproduct of engaging ideas. Trying to shame or humiliate students has nothing to do with Socratic pedagogy and everything to do with bad teaching. Okay, and that was it. I didn't realize we were then. I thought we had uh, another page or two. You know, I mostly agree with uh, Bogosian here. If you're not being an asshole... There's no reason you can't use Socratic uh, pedagogy. Like, this is fine. It's not a grand point about anything. Um, but, like, it's like, yeah, I completely agree with basically the entire point here. Unreal Brian says, in schools of education, they like to rage against lectures. Yeah, I mean, lecturing is not always the best way to do it. Maybe engaging with students in this sort of dialogue, dialectical method is more engaging. Just don't be a dick about it. Okay, anyone here, we have a little review. If you're coming here from Shane's uh, thing, where you know how you get to pick your next adventure when he does a viewer request, this is kind of like that if you're anyone stuck around. Here, we get to review this stuff. Did this paper have fun ideas? Then you type in brain dance. These are uh, BTTV emotes. Type in brain dance and uh, like not the title on the left, but the uh, code on the right, small b, big d. So Tinderio says, it gets a yay. Uh, unfortunately, the other emotes, the non, uh, not the ones that are uh, listed here, then like it won't be recorded. I've Neo said brain dance and yay. So again, you can also use the global emotes yay and nay as you see in chat. That'll give it a thumbs up or thumbs down. So we got two thumbs up and a brain dance from Ivan Neo because I had fun ideas. Now, did this have uh, big claims that shriveled up for grapes? No, this didn't really uh, make any grand claims that shriveled up. It basically said, don't be a dickhead. Um, and I agree with that. Is it navel gazing is it only for academics? Uh kind of but it wasn't terrible unreal brian says better than i expected seems to be from earlier than when uh Bogosi went a little nuts yeah i mean this was not well again this is not like making any grand claims this is just saying look don't be a dick when teaching that's fair so did this have any, like is this ouroboros did this have any deep ancient mysteries or big ideas not really um brain dance yeah uh sorry small b on brain dance scenarios i can fix that later or just a small b big d um this wasn't existential or artistic. Was this all style, no substance? Uh, still poop underneath? Not really. Uh, like, I didn't think it was bad. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, Ivan says my best teacher in high school was a bit of a dick. Basically expecting more from students as, uh, is sometimes a very positive uh, strategy. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Bogosian discounted earlier saying that being a dick is completely useless. And I don't know if that's true. He just... but. So he tried to separate out the Socratic method from being a dick, but he didn't give that maybe being a dick is useful for some things. And that's one of the points against this. Maybe you can't always be the like friendly teacher you want to be. Sometimes you have to like be a bit of an asshole and maybe there is something pedagogically useful about being an asshole. I don't know, but uh, Bogosian here discounted it without really going into it. I don't know. Um, Ivan says, I don't think Socratic method is being a dick separate question. No, exactly. But that's the thing. He discounted it, but he could have just said it's a separate question. And it's a subtle thing and saying, look, it's not Socratic, but like, is it useful versus is it's not Socratic? And so we should put it aside. He just said we should put it aside and it's bad. That doesn't mean he didn't argue for it being bad, uh, thing here. So. Okay, Tindiris as well as book, How to Have Impossible Conversations is basically about it. Okay, I mean, maybe, but like, again, I'd have to look at that. The, he referenced himself earlier when he was discussing it, and I just don't know. Like, I, I can't make a claim on Frank says, being wrong and then corrected teaches you better than just being corrected from the start. Um, yeah, I mean, that seems like you get to learn from where you were moving forward. Uh, Unreal Brian says, then again, I had a social studies teacher in middle school who poured water in the ear of a girl who fell asleep in class. Yeah, see, that's abusive. That's not good. Um, Frank says, so leading a student into saying something wrong so you can correct them might genuinely be more effective. 
Yeah. The question is how do you have to be a dick about that? Like you, do you have to show them that they were wrong? Do you need to give them an example of that? Yeah, I think that might be helpful. You have to get them committed to something that they thought was one way, but then you have to be nice about it and be like, well, you should feel bad about it. No, you have to realize not to feel bad. You just have to kind of track it back so you don't feel terrible about it so you can like learn from where you got, got it wrong. So again, yeah, you're going to get a thumbs up from me. Um, this is just going to get a vote yay. I'm not even going to give it a... Like, I don't actually... Like, frankly... I know, I already knew what the Socratic method was, and, like, this is sort of navel-gazing for me. I'm gonna give it a navel-gazing, because, like, this is only for asshole teachers, and, like, I just, like, you know, should it? No, I guess, in some sense, you can, it says don't be a dick, and, like, everyone can learn about that. So, maybe it is more general, so, yeah. So I'm not gonna give it the navel-gazing, it's fine. Unreal Brian says, a lot of students, however, are going to be very sensitive in a public setting like that. Yeah, that was the other thing in this. The, this focused on the sort of fictional Socratic dialogues, but that's not what happens in real life. That's not what happens in real life. You will piss people off, and you have to be more careful about that. And this paper is saying, well, it's not the Socratic method. It's like, that's nice, but that's a fictionalized account of things. In the paper, yes, from 2011. So, well, whatever. You can write uh, things that are, you know like pedagogy and you can write things that are social theory like it doesn't really matter when this is from like i said though this kind of gave me the sense like it was from of that era from like a decade ago a little bit more optimistic in uh feeling like nowadays it'd be like yeah you don't have to be a dick it's like that's nice everyone everything sucks and you're saying don't be a dick about it it wouldn't it's uh it's just seems a little sort of a wide-eyed optimistic nowadays yeah so, like, that's the thing. It seems a little bit uh, naive that you're not going to piss people off because you do piss people off. And it's against the history in Socrates. Socrates died at the... He got condemned to death by the state because he did piss people off. And you'd be like, oh, well, that wasn't his intention. It doesn't matter if that wasn't his intention. It still happens. Yeah, Dick, Dick Bigley. Thank you, Unreal Brian, for that. Yeah, so... It seems a little bit naive, this, uh, well, not, maybe, not naive, it seems a little bit, uh, wide-eyed, sort of, like, uh, optimistic, that, uh, so, I'm not 100, like, it, it just, the feel of this, it's like, yeah, okay, it says, don't be a dick, and Socratic method doesn't require you to be a dick, so don't use, don't explain that, oh, I'm being a dick because it's a Socratic method, sure, but, I mean, if you were a dick, you're a dick anyway, and it wouldn't make any difference. And Socratic method isn't going to give you the way out. Pagosian is correct about that. But again, that really only matters to the dickheads. Okay. Thank you all for being here and reviewing. I really appreciate it. Um, 